Okay, we, 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 we are ready to go, and, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everybody here today. We've really got a, uh, a very full program, so we're going to try and keep on time. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. My name is Cyril Meyerowitz. I'm at the University of Rochester Eastman Institute for Oral Health. Uh, I'm the regional director of the Northeast region of the National Dental PBRN. Uh, it's a great pleasure, in fact, uh, to have assembled a very interesting group of people uh, uh, here today. Uh, we have people really from a broad range, from a lot of communities, uh, people from basic science, uh, people from uh, pr practitioners, uh, behavioral scientists, clinical investigators. Uh, we have people from a lot of different countries as well, so there's a lot of great international representation. Uh, all of these people uh, are here, I assume, because they're interested in uh, practice-based research that improves clinical outcomes. Uh, so it's a great uh, pleasure to have this group. It did occur to me that we don't have patients here today, but th that's for another time. But I think all of us, the patients, are probably in some, in some form or another. Uh, practice-based research really offers opportunities for uh, bi-directional interactions uh, that translates science into practical application and clinical practice. Uh, and today's symposium is really about exploring those opportunities and understanding some of the challenges of that setting. I think it's a fascinating setting with interesting questions and interesting study design issues. And if you look at the program, we've tried to incorporate a very broad variety of topic areas uh, so that we can have a discussion about a broad range of topics. So this is sort of a, a hybrid symposium. It's, it's not so much traditional. Uh, we're going to have a symposium part which starts out, and I'll introduce the speakers as they come along, to set the stage for the discussion that takes place at the tables. Uh, the tables that all of you are sitting at, and I, 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 for those people who are not yet sitting at a table, uh, if there is an open chair, uh, you can read the agenda and try and pick the topic that you like, because there are topics that uh, span the field uh, bi-directional research, study design in various content areas. Uh, there's practitioner research and communications, and there's a global table, uh, one on behavioral science uh, and its application to practice-based research. Uh, so at the table discussions, there are going to be some questions that have been uh, suggested. The table leaders, uh, uh, there's a table leader at each table, uh, an expert in the field. Uh, who's going to lead the discussion, and we've tried to balance the tables so we have people from very different uh, communities of interest uh, to encourage a discussion that goes across uh, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different groups. Uh, after the uh, table discussion, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion uh, which is going to be up front here where the table leaders will report out uh, on the discussion that's taken place. And so hopefully it'll give everybody an opportunity to get a flavor for what's it, what the questions are like. I think we recognize that in these small discussions, we have sort of broad ranging discussions. Our hope is to take away uh, from these tables, which are also co-facilitated by people within the practice-based research network community, to take away a few positive suggestions about the topic areas at the end. So if we go away with one or two positive suggestions about the way we can actually look at this field and improve it, then I think we've accomplished something very good. Uh, I think you all know that, uh, uh, by the way, I'd like you to hold your questions until the panel discussion, because we've got a fairly, so if you have a question, write it down, and during the panel discussion, you can have an opportunity to ask it. As you might know, the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research, NIDCR, has made significant investments and commitments to uh, practice-based research and funds the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. Uh, it's therefore a great pleasure to have our first speaker, Martha Summerman, the director of NIDCR, uh, to welcome you all and to set the stage for the symposium. As we're getting this set up, um, just to welcome everybody. And I apologize. The reason why we're running a little late is I went, I can't read directions, so I went to Hall A rather than Ballroom A. How many other people did that? Hey. <laughs> so um, greetings. Um, 
everybody. I know there's a, um, a great speaker is here and I was allowed five minutes. I said, can you give me 10 minutes? Because I get very excited about the practice-based networks and what's going on here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Mark, Mark Myrowitz. Um, Cyril. Cyril is what I call him, so it's easier for me, Myrowitz. But and um, for his relentless uh, putting us to task almost every day, getting this symposium together. So really, special thanks for him for his efforts on that. So let's give him a cheer, and for all the other uh, people joining me, and of course Greg. Um, special thanks there. Um, also, I want to call out to the global table because. This is when we were putting this practice-based research network symposium together. One of the things that I happened to be uh, visiting in Brazil, and I met a faculty person there who I think is right there, who said, we want to do something like this. And so it's because of your interactions with me that, and then it was one table, and I think they're now, we're the globals. Global teams go. So there are two tables now that are involved in that. So. Thank you for that. So the Practice Space Network, maybe one other um, story about this. So I was very fortunate. I've been involved in the second phase. The first phase is the brainchild of all the incredible staff at NIDCR. I'm very humbled to be the director. It's the staff that do, do everything and have the brains behind this, and I just get to say what you do. But, I was involved with the practice-based research networks when I was at the University of Washington. And when you initially wrote these proposals, I said, how do you write something about this? And I saw our, our head of that, that was Tim Darun at the time, he had hypothesis, he had specific aims, and I never saw such energy of the dental community and the dentists involved in the practice-based network. So I got it, it works, and the major goal here is the importance to the practitioners, to the patients, and the outcome. Plus, recognizing that we need to move science into the clinics. And while that basic science part will always be our bread and butter, there's also a need to move it in more quickly than we do at this time as well, but the practice-based networks keep moving it along. But one aspect that I think, so now it's one directional we're getting from the basic to the translational to the clinical. What we need, and I would need from the dental communities and those of the dentists involved in outside practice, as well as the di dental hygienists, the lab technicians, the research, all researchers, is the bi-directional. And the bi-directional is moving it from your practice and the new information that's going on that you see a patient that responds differently, whether it's positive or negatively, getting that back to the basic scientists. Let me give you one beautiful example. So this is in the oldest practice-based network where there was a um, reports of this osteonecrosis of the jaw and not, um, and the drug companies are saying, oh, no, 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 this is because of these patients that are taking other medications. It has nothing to do with the bisphosphonates. Sure enough, as you can see from this study, it was recognized that, in fact, the bisphosphonates are a risk factor while it's related to high dose and other issues. But then, why? And so this is a beautiful bi-directional example that I think could have happened more rapidly if some of the dentists in the community knew where to contact the researchers, but NIDCR did. And so we said, we need to develop models. We need to understand why osteonecrosis of the jaw versus other tissues of the body. And so we funded studies in this, developing rat, rat models. The rat models look very similar to the human models. But bottom line, recognizing through these models, still not total understanding of what's going on here, but it's tied into infection, it's tied into um, extractions, and um, increased immune compromised systems. So another thing that came out of this is that vitamin D deficiency may also be a risk factor. So a lot of moving from the clinical to the basic science. The money that we uh, put into this on the global basis was about 9.9 .9 million over seven years last go around, and 9.6 million 
this go around with a much more. Last time we had about 40 studies. Now we're planning on 20 total studies, very focused with larger, more careful analysis of the data than the first. Um, not that the first one wasn't great, it's just that um, more structured to the second one, lessons learned. So we had a lot of practitioners in the first uh, part, many subjects enabling you to do evidence-based science here. Um, and lots of publications um, important to the practice, important to our patients. You're going to see this slide again, but this is fast forward. In the first uh, rendition, there were three different um, independent groups uh, with some collaboration, some conversation. Now we have a central hub with six regional areas, and uh, Dr. Greg Gilbert's going to be talking about this more. But um, the model seems to be working beautifully. And while some of these numbers are smaller than others, every single state has practitioners that are involved. I think that's incredible. I think that gives um, credibility to the dentists in the community, to Dr. Greg Gilbert and his efforts, and also our staff as well. One of the interesting things is to watch the growth. So the blue is the dentist, the red is the dental hygienist, and also the non-practitioners. Uh, and who are those non-practitioners? There are students, there are lab techs, there are staffers, there are investigators, there are researchers. And it's very interesting that that group appears to be growing more rapidly than the others, but we're still on a steady, rapid curve, so there's still a lot of interest. I love the enthusiasm. So giving you an example of some of the studies that are going on um, in the practice-based no network. So all of us, and I know uh, when I was more actively practicing than now, and even I have friends that have this pain, they don't know what it is, they say they have cracked tooth um, syndrome, and so one of this is getting this reg registry, a very important study. Then decision aids that affect uh, suspicious occlusal carious lesions. So what are the devices, do the, devi do the devices that are being used influence your decisions and what you're going to do? And then dental hypersensitivity, the evaluation of that treatment over an eight week period. And then the single, count, single uh, unit crowns, what are the criteria for success? Are there any specific things that are being used that predict success more than others? And stay tuned for some things that are going to be released. And I heard some more excitement about some of these at a symposium I was at. So one is the anterior open bite decision, decisions on how to treat and then one year um, outcome. But one that was very, um, so I went to an HPV um, oral cancer symposium this morning looking at biomarkers. And this is an HPV 16 uh, screening to see how it's um, feasibility and acceptability acceptability. And then um, in the end of 2015, looking at oral cancers and when decisions to refer, as well as the dental information networks and how we gain information from each other. And so these are very exciting things, very promising directions. I can't tell you how, I'm ex how excited I am about this, how excited I am about... I was looking forward to this um, even though I got lost um, all week. So uh, thank you and thank you for your participation. Uh, thank you very much, Martha. Our, our next speaker uh, is uh, Greg Gilbert, uh, who's the uh, National Director of the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. Greg uh, is at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, uh, and he's going to give an introduction, a brief overview of the PBRN. Thank you. So in the next five minutes, uh, I'm going to focus on orienting you to the National Dental PBRN and orienting you to the PBRN context in general. So uh, some of you are not familiar with either one. Some of you are familiar with both. So we're going to uh, focus on orientation in about the next five minutes. So what is a PBRN and why should we care? Well, the message from this slide is that research contexts exist along a continuum. So at one end of the continuum is laboratory research, in vitro, animal research. 
So this is the research context to engage if you have an intervention that is not ready for humans. Progress to clinical trials in academic settings. This is the context to engage if you have an intervention that is not ready for patients. PBRNs, if you have an intervention that is not ready for practices. Community-based research, if you have an intervention that's not ready for communities. So in the academic health center clinical trial setting, this typically focuses on efficacy, not effectiveness, but efficacy. And by efficacy, we simply mean, can an intervention work under ideal conditions? So you typically have highly selected patients in a clinical environment that is not operating under financial constraints, time constraints from the real world. You typically have practitioners who are highly trained, they're specialized or super specialized. But this is a, the place to do the research if you need to investigate efficacy. Can it work under ideal conditions? If you want to investigate effectiveness, then do it in the PBRN. By effectiveness, it, we're investigating, does the research uh, does the in, in intervention work under real-world conditions where just about everyone receives their care? So real-world conditions, the typical conditions, the typical patients, the typical financial and operating constraints. So does it work in the real world? Okay. So the take-home message is that every one of these research contexts has important strengths and everyone has significant limitations. So if you want to advance a research agenda overall, you're probably best going to need to engage all four of these contexts. I love this quote, if we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. So the old model is that academic types like myself would dream up projects We'd focus on doing them well, we'd publish them, and then those study results would sit on the virtual shelf and be promptly ignored by clinicians. PBRN is just the opposite. We make a point of engaging the end user from the outset. After all, we're producing this information, we're producing this evidence so that the end user will actually use it. We want the end user to look at the results and say, ah, this can actually make a difference in what I do in my practice tomorrow. Not a decade from now. This result can actually make a difference in what I do tomorrow. So that is why we make a point of engaging the end user, also known as the clinician, sometimes the patient. We are organized as a single unified national network. We have six regions. Uh, a lot of our activity is focused at the regional level. We do integrate across nationally certain tasks. If you have a study idea, the typical pathway is to approach someone in your region, uh, typically the regional director. So we really do make a point of engaging the end user, the practitioner at every step of the process and our research is dramatically improved as a result of doing that from the outset and every step after that. And I can tell you that practitioners are excellent at generating ideas for studies, developing study design, who would have thought it? Who, I mean, maybe just academic types should be doing that? No, practitioners actually have a lot to offer. The old model, essentially ignored this immense amount of practical clinical wisdom that's out in the community with practitioners. Thank goodness now we're actually engaging that practical clinical wisdom in the entire research process. They have tremendous input on designing data collection forms, feasibility testing, pilot testing, data collection, data analysis, and yes, they are often very good at presentations, being the ones up at the front of the room instead of just listening in the audience, as well as participate in manuscript preparation. These are the, the top five reasons that practitioners tell us that they like engaging the network and being part of it. So these are not 
things that academic types like myself have dreamed up. These are what practitioners tell us. They say they like participating in network research because it increases the stature of their practice. It sets them apart. They're special. It conveys to patients that they stay current. It provides new, rewarding collegial interactions. They're compensated for the time doing the research. Now, the typical project is about treatment that they're going to do anyway. So what we're compensating them for is the time spent doing informed consent, completing data collection forms, that sort of thing. And they like the fact that they can participate as much or as little as they want. They might not be interested in all the studies. They might not want to make room in their practice to participate in all studies, maybe just one at a time. That's okay. No problem. If you have an idea, then this is an overview of the study development process. It's on our website, and this is intended just to provide an overview. The starting point is to engage, typically, a regional director in your region, talk about it, put something on paper, and engage in discussion and move it from there. I encourage you to enroll. If you haven't enrolled, it's a simple process. Simply go to the website, go to Enroll Now. You can see what the questionnaire is like on the website before you take it, if you like. With our practitioners, we emphasize kind of a customer service approach. We want to make research easy for them, not burdensome. So we engage them at every step of the process, at every step of the way, and I think it makes it fun and rewarding for them. Wouldn't it be nice, uh, a, a great vision, if 20 years hence a dentist is at a social gathering, someone comes up, oh, you're a dentist? Do you happen to do research? And the dentist is kind of taken back. Well, yes, of course I do research. I'm a dentist. That's just part of what we do as a profession. Well, this is a way to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, our next speakers, we've got uh, two, uh, uh, two talks. The first talk uh, is uh, by Sonia Makija and uh, Jim Bader, uh, and they're going to be speaking about resolving uncertainty and suspicious occlusal lesions through practice-based research. Uh, the other topic is in pain. Uh, Don Nixdorf is going to do that one. Uh, we've tried to actually have speakers who've actually been through the process of doing research, so you're going to see uh, them taking the idea from the science uh, through to the research itself. So let me invite, uh, uh, Jim is going to start out, okay. Good afternoon. I'm assuming that this mic works and I don't have to hold onto the lavalier for five minutes. Can you hear me? You can hear me, good. Um, Sonia and I are going to describe three studies for you that have all been done within the network over the last few years. And the studies all focused on the same thing, suspicious occlusal lesions. We call them suspicious occlusal carious lesions, but we may revise the name soon. This is the object of our uh, attention. Uh, this kind of occlusal surface causes consternation, if not uncertainty, in some clinicians. They don't know whether to do nothing, do something, do everything. And it is really an issue. Are there caries present? Has the carious lesion penetrated to the dentin? And we've got several examples of these. A couple of years ago, as a, as a part of a larger questionnaire that was sent to all um, network members, we included this photograph and asked um, the network members, how would you treat this tooth? And we got over 500 responses. And here's the distribution of responses. 29% of the respondents said that I would do no treatment and no further diagnostic testing is, is necessary. They, we, were, we told them the radiograph was negative for any kind of um, a carious lesion or periapical disease. 20% said I would do some preventive treatment, but that's all. 35% said I'll do minimally invasive treatment with or with not, without any associated preventive treatment and 14% said, I would restore the tooth, full restoration, with or without associated preventive treatment. And then, of course, there's the 1% that said, I'll do something completely different. Um, those outliers are generally not paid much attention to. But here's the issue. What do you do with this kind of tooth? 
Sus uh, suspicious occlusal carrier lesions cause uncertainty, and they certainly, as we just showed, cause, causes variation in treatment decisions. Despite this, there's very, very little in the literature that describes this lesion or what to do with it. It's one of those things where the uncertainty that dentists express, and my colleague Dan Sugars and I have known this for 20 years because we've been doing these kinds of studies, and this is one of the things that dentists always complain about, but how, it's never gotten back to the research community. At any rate, what do you do with it? Well, we have done two studies in the network, and are starting the third one, that, that attempted to get some information about these lesions. So we're going to describe those. The first study involved 82 rec practitioners, and each of these practitioners enrolled 100 consecutive patients if the patient was eligible. And the only el eligibility criterion was that the, the patient had one occlusal surface that was unrestored. If the patient was enrolled, then the patient was examined. And the examination was to answer these three questions we had. What's the prevalence of these lesions? I'm going to call them SOCLs for convenience. What were the characteristics? We were hoping we would get a definitive pattern of characteristics so that we could then say, aha, that's what one looks like. And how are they treated in these practices? Now, the practitioner filled out a consecutive patient log, which is really quite simple. And then if the patient was enrolled, filled out a, what's called a case report form that described whether the lesion was present and if so, what it looked like. So here's what we found. In terms of prevalence, these things are quite prevalent. 34% of patients that had at least one unrestored occlusal surface had one of these lesions. 10% of all unrestored at-risk teeth had an SOCL. In terms of the characteristics, we weren't quite as lucky as we hoped for, although 85% of the uh, lesions expressed a dark color versus light, 55 were smooth versus 45% rough, 51 were shiny, 49% were chalky, and 52% were in the mandible, and 48% were in the maxilla, with 69% on molars. So we didn't get one single definitive pattern that would be very easy to identify. These things are all over the place. In terms of the treatment that were rendered to these diseases, uh, to these uh, lesions, 70% of the lesions that were identified were monitored. The dentist said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to watch this lesion over the next appointment or series of appointments. 16% received a sealant, and 14% received some sort of restoration involved cutting the tooth. Of those restored teeth, in 18% of the uh, time, there was no lesion present when the tooth was finally opened. In 10%, the uh, clinician judged the lesion to be inactive, and in 72% of the time, there was an active lesion found. Of those active lesions, 29% were confined to the enamel, and 71% extended into the dentin. So just looking from this step down here, you can see there is some room for improvement in our management decisions for these lesions. So study one was a cross-sectional observational design. Study two is a longitudinal observational design. And it takes 53 of the original 82 dentists, and they tracked the lesions they had enrolled at baseline for 20 months. That means there were 1,341 of these lesions that were followed for 20 months. And we were interested in the outcomes, what happened to these teeth in that 20-month period. And we wanted to know separately what happened to the ones that were monitored at baseline, those that were sealed at baseline, and those that were restored at baseline. So in terms of the outcomes of the monitored lesions, 90% were continued to be monitored the last time we saw them at 20 months. No intervention was deemed to be necessary by the clinician following that tooth. 6% of that group were sealed, and 4% had to be restored. Of those that were sealed at baseline, 6% had to be resealed, and 4% had to be re-restored of those that were originally restored at baseline. So to sum up what we've learned from these two studies, suspicious lesions are really quite prevalent. One in three patients are going to have at least one of these lesions. And nearly half of the lesions that were opened didn't extend into the dentin, or were inactive, or weren't present at all. Nearly half, 48%. And if you leave them alone, a great majority of these lesions don't progress in the 20-month observation period that we had. So we concluded from these two studies that we need to develop some sort of detection method that would more accurately identify 
those lesions that were going to be, or that were already progressed into the dentin, because that is the standard of care today, it may not be tomorrow, but it is today for surgical intervention. So we have study three, and I'll leave the description of that to Sonia. Thanks, Bader. So Bader did a great job of explaining the first two studies and the results that we got from that. And as you can see, there was a lot of variability. And so that piqued our interest for the third study, which I'm happy to say that pilot testing we've done and we're ready to launch this month. And it's looking at caries detecting devices. So what's the issue? Well, these carry detecting devices that are out on the market, they emphasize the ability to detect early caries. But however, the really crucial ability is really just to differentiate between enamel and dentinal caries. However, the research that we've got so far indicates that yes, these devices do work and they do um, detect dentinal lesions. However, there's a lot of false positives. So we're hoping with this study we can resolve some of these issues. In January, there was a Wall Street Journal article and it looked at the caries detecting devices and in particular, it looked at the canary system, which uses heat. And what they found for these early lesions, um, it, it correctly identified 93% of these lesions compared to about 27% for radiographs. So what they concluded, yes, these devices do work, but we need more clinical studies. And this is where the network is coming in. So what do we want answered? Well, our primary for focus is to see, does use of these devices result in more or fewer lesions being treated surgically? And if they're being treated surgically, does the proportion extending into dentin increase or decrease? As Bader mentioned in our first two studies, what we found out is that almost half the lesions that were open were either no caries, inactive caries, or caries limited to the enamel. So this is a, a real problem. So I'm gonna describe the study that we're gonna be doing in, in our uh, third study. So to begin with, before a practitioner um, does a clinical portion, they're gonna do a pre-study vignette. And these are basically case presentations, and I'll, I'll show you an example of how you would treat a tooth and, and how likely that tooth has a lesion that is uh, into dentin. So after, and there are 16 scenarios. So after the pre-study vignette, the practitioner enrolls 20 patients with a SOCL. They record the lesion characteristic, what their treatment decision is, and if they open them, do the caries go into dentin? And this is an observational study. It's the practitioner's decision on how they want to treat these teeth. So after they've enrolled the 20 lesions, they'll be randomized into one of three arms. The first arm is no device. Um, they'll just enroll the 20 patients again, record the lesion characteristics, the treatment decision, and if the caries, uh, how deep the caries were. The next arm is the diagnodent. Um, same thing, they'll enroll 20 patients, lesion characteristics, but this time they also add the device score, reading of the um, diagnodent, the treatment decision, and how deep the lesion was if they decided to open it. And the third arm is the spectra, uh, lesion characteristics, they record the spectra score and their treatment decision and how deep the lesion was if they opened it. And then after they enroll these 20 patients, they take a post-study vignette, which will have the same scenario. We want to see if there's any changes in their behavior pre and post-study. And they will also answer a post-study questionnaire on the utility of the device, if they got any information anywhere else. So this is an example of the study vignette. We found from the previous studies, there are four main cues or characteristics that are very important. First is the patient's risk, the color of the tooth, the luster of the tooth, and the feel of the lesion with the probe or explorer. So uh, we've got these four main cues. So we give a background on the patient, um, characteristics and tooth characteristics. They use a slider to see how likely it is that the lesion extends in a dentin and their uh, preferred treatment for that tooth. Most of you are familiar with the diagnodent. It's a pin type device. It measures changes in fluorescence. If it's a clean, to healthy tooth, it exhibits no fluorescence, so you'll have a low reading. But if there's caries, there's bacteria, it will um, generate a higher number based on how deep the caries is. For the spectra, it also uses fluorescence. It's actually a camera that you go over the tooth, you freeze it, and it shows a photo um, of the tooth with both numbers and colors. It's almost like a Doppler, um, and it gives a range of sound enamel and all the way to deep dentin caries. 
And it can also be used if you decide to open the tooth and are removing the caries. It can also be used during the restorative phase to see if you've removed all the caries. So this study is, has a pre and post control group and also a randomized clinical trial because you're randomized into to one of three arms. We hope to enroll about 3,600 patients. We've got 108 dentists across the network that are uh, participating in this study. So each practitioner will enroll 40 patients, 20 in the pre-intervention phase and 20 in the intervention phase. And it'll occur in two blocks because what we found in the previous studies is that on average, practitioners see about 19 of these lesions per month. So we're giving them about four weeks to enroll it in each phase. So for a patient to particip participate in the study, they need to be at least six years of age, and this is on permanent teeth only. And the treatment can occur either at that visit or you can follow up with the treatment if you decide to do operative and, and need to reschedule them. So for the tooth to be eligible, it needs to have no radiographic evidence of caries in a dentin based on whatever radiographs you have available. But you do suspect that there's caries because of roughness, surface opacities, sensitivity to cold or sweets, or staining. And of course, you need to have no restoration or no sealant on the occlusal surface. So this is an example of our screening log. Um, you approach the patient. If they decide not to consent, you just mark the reason, and, and that's it. We don't take any other information. If they decide to consent, then you uh, fill out this information on them. And then you or the patient completes a patient characteristic form. It's just basic information, age, gender, race, ethnicity. And then you do your dental assessment. So the information that we're looking for is color of the tooth, luster of the lesion, what age you used in making your decision, if you used any type of dental explorer, and then we ask some basic questions for the um, patient's risk assessment. And then um, you mark how deep you estimate the lesion to be, and then um, choose your treatment that you did. And if you did open the tooth, we wanted to know how deep the carious lesions ended up being. So we just completed our pilot of the study and we got a lot of great feedback. We were able to revise the patient log to make it more simple and flow in your office a little bit better. We changed some of the photos that are in the operatory. You can either, it uses as a prompt to enroll these types of lesions. Also when you're consenting patients, it's good to show them the types of lesions that you're looking at. We've revised the training manual so that when the regional coordinators come and train you in the study, it's a little bit more easy to understand. And we revised the vignettes to make it um, simpler to fill out. So we're very excited about getting the results from this study. From the studies one and two, we had articles in Carey's Research, in JADA, and most recently we were the cover story for the November 2014 issue of JADA. So this topic is really important and we're excited to see what the results are. So. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, our next speaker, uh, is, we're going to shift gears a little bit to pain and the studies that are done in pain. And the speaker is Don Nixdorf from the University of Minnesota, who's going to present resolving uncertainty and, uh, sorry, understanding how patients develop persistent pain following root canal therapy. Thank you, Cyril, and uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to this. So this is a topic that um, is important to me uh, from a researcher, but I would say it's also important to a lot of people here, and I'll kind of show why. And what I'm going to focus on a little bit is, is unlike the uh, suspicious occlusal caries, this is a topic where the diagnostic uncertainty is not so much an issue. It's more of the outcome of typical procedures that are being given. So the, the, the setup for that is, Different observational studies have been shown, about 3 to 12 percent. The newest one that came out of the Pearl Network, which is out of NYU, showed about 5.3 percent in an almost four-year follow-up stage had persistent pain associated root canal therapy. So you go, oh God, is that a really big problem? It seems like a small number. But it's about 16 million people, estimated by the ADA, are getting initial root canals each year. So to put that in context, that's one in 20 Americans. So if you are a representation of the American population, there's about 140 people here. That means this lecture is important to seven of you, because about seven will be having root canals this year, and another seven next year, and another, and another. And you can see where I'm kind of going to this. And another way of looking at this is, is dentistry provides care to a whole spectrum of people. 
And this may be a model that we can look at for persistent pain overall, because we treat healthy people, we treat people that are not so healthy, full spectrum of everything, and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit. So this can be ways of looking at mechanisms. And that kind of leads me to what I was tasked to do, and that was talk about how do we think about research? And that's why I took a little bit of a different approach than uh, Bader and Sonia. I'm gonna talk about what's the thinking behind the process of how we move this through and where do we get some of that information as we move along the process. So whenever you start talking about a problem, you need to kind of know where you are. So in other words, if we want to know where you want to go, you need to know where you've been, where you are now, and where you're going forward. So research is incremental. We stand on the shoulders of others that have come before us. And the people that come before us have been two studies in this area. And you, as an academic, I can sit and criticize most things. I could probably criticize my, my own research probably the best, because I know where all the problems are. But looking at some of this, this gives us some ideas about where are some of the potential aspects of what you want to look at as far as predictors. So how I'm looking at this problem is, is we have an outcome. We've been doing root canals for decades and our outcomes really haven't changed. So what are some of the things that patients bring or procedures do that are related to the outcome? And that's what this research was kind of looking at. And they were saying, hey, is it the amount of pain that people have ahead of time? Is it because it's in pain? Do they have other problems, chronic pain problems? In other words, is their sensory system dysfunctional in general? Are they female? Maybe there's something different between females and males as it relates to pain. Um, as well as one of the recent studies, they looked at it and their findings were more on the other side. They found things tended to be perspective, protective. In other words, certain groups did not seem to get the problems, in this case, non-Hispanic Latinos, as well as a diagnosis of pulpitis without any disease at the apex of the tooth or uh, periapical uh, pathosis. So that's kind of the background. And some of the other background is the first study. I refer to it as a pilot study that he did in uh, the network before. And what this study had was is two main aims. One, it was looking at feasibility. As this was kind of new, as uh, Dr. Summerman and uh, Greg talked about, we were just trying to get our understanding about how do we work with these? What questions can we answer with them? How uh, good as the data that we're going to be able to get out of these types of things. So one of my first questions was is can I do this? How good can it be that aspect of things? And I'm happy to report I think it turned out well. So I was able to engage 62 dentists throughout these five geographic regions. They had to screen 1.5 patients to get one to say yes I want to do it, stick through it, and finish two obturations. In other words the, the tooth was restorable and all the different things there. That's pretty impressive because my other hat sitting in academics Usually you have to screen a lot more patients to get one that fit that narrow criteria. So this is kind of data suggesting to me that this is an average type of patient coming in uh, and dentists were able to engage them. So we were able to enroll lots of patients quickly. That's another real benefit associated with PBRN research. It's large numbers of dentists, large numbers of patients. You can get answers about typical things that are out in um, the care world. In this case, we need to look at follow-up data. So a, uh, a risk associated with it is, is well, yeah, the, these clinicians out in the community, they're not going to be able to follow their patients back. You won't be able to get information. Yeah, they treat them and off they go. I would say not so. We had 93% follow-up rate of data at one week and 92% at six months. So I think you can guard against some of those potential risks of where you can have bias creep into your studies by paying attention to methodology. So I think you can do that in a network. And what we found out of this, the second aim of the study, was how big is this problem that we're looking at? Because the studies before were designed retrospectively. If you look forward, maybe we'll see what we get. And we found it was 10%. And our conference interval, in other words, how confident are we that the data is actually uh, in that range is 7.8 to 12.5%. So I'm fairly confident this problem is real and it's there based on this research. So the nice thing about pilot data is you get to explore that data about what does it tell you about the next step. So one of the things that researchers often do is they'll go, okay, yes, it was designed for one thing. Now let's see if we can look at it a different way that I can kind of project where I'm going with my research. So we started doing this, and this is uh, almost ready for publication here. Um, we looked at our existing data set. 
to see, well, what does it tell us about these predictive factors? Because that's where we want to go. We want to know before we start dental care, who's going to have problems? Because if we know beforehand, maybe we can do something different. Maybe we can take steps in place so that we can change those negative outcomes. So before you can do that, you need to know who's at high risk. And what you do is you do some mathematical modeling called regression analysis. And what it is, the model is a mathematical representation about how the data relates to each other. So what we thought was, there's three things that need to be in there, and that's what we called uh, variables that we forced in. We thought patients that see endodontists versus patients that see general dentists, they're different patients. So we need to make sure that we control for that. That's why we put them in the model. There's lots of information in other areas that talk about pain and gender, whether it be other surgeries, chronic pain in general, uh, and my patient population is overwhelmingly female so, uh, female, so that goes into the model. Age has been associated with it, and that's a typical thing in this type of research that you'd put in there. So those are the ones we said to the model, we have to have those in there. What else comes out of that model? So this is kind of like a screening process and we had 71 variables up front, and we looked at, well, okay, in the screening process, nine of them seemed to hold tight to begin with. So we had a, a statistical cutoff of 0.1, and then we said, okay, those nine go into the model in a stepwise approach, and the outcome is what you're seeing here in the bolded, and that is, is the patient's pain, they gave a rating of zero days of pain, one, two, all the way up to seven. So when they show up to your office, they're getting a root canal. If they've said, I have zero days of pain, they're going to be at lower risk. If I have seven days, they're going to be at higher risk. And for each increased day, that 19 of the 1.9, that 19 is about 19% risk per day. So it's incremental as it increases. So that's a big difference. So duration of pain showing up to your office seems to be a factor in this data set. Another thing that seemed to be protective was is what their expectation was. And I find this is kind of a curious thing because for me, being a researcher, 708 patients, we got data on the baseline data of 706. I would have expected to have all sorts of responses on this. And this was a four-point scale of very good, good, fair, and poor. Out of 706 patients, zero said their outcome was going to be poor. I would have expected someone would have just made a ticking error. I know, it might have been me. But the point is, is that's telling us that, huh, it's a little in, a validation check internally saying, these patients are consented properly. They know what they're getting into. If they didn't think it was going to turn out, they didn't do it. So that kind of makes sense. So we had to kind of look at it. So the people that said they thought the outcome was very good, it was protective. Now, I have a hard time understanding what a, an odds ratio is 0.39, but if I flip it around, so someone that said they were going to have it, they would have two and a half times less likely to have an outcome of persistent pain than someone who was not very optimistic about it. So that's what it kind of looks at. So the other thing that came in here is our statistical model came close to showing household income. So that's one measure of socioeconomic status. Um, and then you're kind of thinking about that, so, well, that's interesting. And you start looking around, and yeah, there's quite a bit of data that shows social economic status as outcome for almost any healthcare outcome. And you can kind of pontificate about how you potentially use it. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later as we go forward. So how do we plan on using this data? So in other words, getting to the question that, that Greg brought up, and that is, is why we do this research? We do it to improve patient care. So how I plan on using the data from this type of research that I'm going to be uh, talking about later. I'm going to do something like this. So this is data coming from a cardiovascular study, Framingham study, it's a big famous one. And what you're seeing here is, is they've kind of taken their data and they've started putting it into a format that now you, you as a consumer can start understanding it, and calling it a risk calculator. And that's what we're going to be planning on doing. So if you're male, your data falls into the, the far right two columns. And if you're a smoker, you're on the far right column. And age from the bottom up, so I know it's hard to see, is the, the bottom range is 40 years old. And what you're predicting is, are you going to get an MI in the next 10 years? So luckily, I'm still in my 40s. I'm a non-smoker male. It's mostly green. I'm less than 2%. I'm pretty happy. But you can see as I age, my risk levels are going to go up. So that's how you can see how this data can help. So it's using seven different factors that have been shown over multiple studies. Uh, so it's kind of validating this model, this way of looking at the data. And this can start 
kind of driving your decision making. So that's kind of why when we look at age in males, we might want to start looking at addressing cholesterol and hypertension and stuff to decrease that risk. Does that make sense? So why aren't we doing this for dentistry? And that's what I would like to change with my research. So again, pilot data. So this is just a, an example of using it. So we have those six variables that we put in the model. Since we modeled all of them, you have to answer all of them. So you gotta pay attention to that. So I have to put in the ones that even if the data doesn't really have a, a lot of outcome as far as changing a risk, the model uh, works with them in there. So this is an example of low risk. This is 2%. So you have an age, you could change that age to anything since the odds ratio was one, it wouldn't make a big difference on that. But this is a typical patient, has no pain coming in, no duration of pain, thinks expectation's gonna come out well, um, and household income is above 50,000. And the flip side to that, if you put the three risk factors that are really driving this, you can get up to almost uh, one third chance of having outcome of persistent pain. And that is, is they have seven days of pain at baseline, they don't think it's gonna turn out well, and social and economic measure is showing that they're uh, on the low side. So, that's kind of where I wanted to go. So where does this fit in with research and thinking? Um, and I want to use an example of kind of how research kind of puts together. So Greg kind of gave you a continuum of types of research. I want to kind of give you a continuum of thinking about research so you can look at that. I'm going to use an example, one that you may have heard of, and that is scurvy. And uh, where it's kind of, st uh, most people will think about, maybe you'll know James Lynn, but he's the one that did uh, one of the first clinical trials. And he did it down in 1747. But the story doesn't start with him, it starts with some of the first reports in the English literature, it was a sea captain. That sea captain reported that, hey, if I give people that, uh, so they just open label, case report, study, said, hey, if I give some lemon juice to my uh, seamen, they didn't have any problems. So that's what James Lancaster uh, and his other colleague, Richard uh, Hawkins, reported. And Lind made some of the other observations. So these are the people in the front lines kind of seeing the problem, and, and Lind, articulated that problem really well. And this, his quote was, the number of seamen in time of war who died of shipwreck, capture, famine, fire or sword are but an inconsiderable in respect as such of those destroyed by the ship's diseases. So he's basically saying, we're a warship and my crewmen are dying from disease, not fighting. So how can I change this? So that was the observation and they did a clinical trial. And that clinical trial, led us to understanding how the role of vitamin C. They didn't know it then, but they had an intervention before they knew the mechanism. And an early adopter of this new knowledge, which hopefully you guys all in the room are gonna be early adopters of knowledge coming out of the network, was James Cook. So he took this information from James Lind and he had, was very successful. He made some of the longest voyages because he had healthy crews. So he explored the South Pacific and so forth. And then the British enacted some policy. So I have a British colleague in the background. They're really good at policy. Uh, I always give him about the, a hard time about his paperwork habits. So, but the policy helps here. Good information, you got an intervention, you're making a change, put it in policy, have a wider, broader effect. That makes sense. And then some smart people kind of figured out, well, what's going on? And then now, 336 years later, after the invention, and some years later after that, scurvy really doesn't exist in society about kind of that process. So this is a continuum kind of knowledge and thinking and, and problem solving involving different components of things. Um, and if you think this is not the norm, you're wrong. There's a, a nice article kind of reviews uh, most of them. So even in the single disease entity type things, this is the norm. Now we're looking at more multifactorial type of diseases and then so it's a little bit more complicated about what are some of the different vectors, but this is actually uh, what we'd expect the information to go on. I'm just gonna move down to my notes here a little bit. And one of the things is when you're down where Lancaster in the observations, you need to kind of be thinking about some of those aspects. You gotta be describing the phenomenon well you're needing to look at what are the behaviors and associations so you can start understanding how this works when it's multifactorial. 
And then when you move in more into the James Lynn section there, you're looking at your initial highly controlled trials, and then you'll be moving into the pragmatic trials. And Greg referred to that as your eff um, eff efficaciousness and then effectiveness trials. And then you'll be moving on of, okay, how is this actually working? What are the mechanisms underneath that and pulling that apart? So after that history lesson, I just wanted to kind of move back into my research into how are we starting to think about this? So I told you we're trying to model or try and get a conceptual idea about how are all these things working. So that's why we call it a conceptual diagram. And what you're looking at here is the biopsychosocial model. And this is the model that provides the dominant factors and what you have on, in the red box is what we refer to as the biological factors. Um, and the other ones there. And they are interacting both between themselves and onto the individual that's there. And that individual is going to be getting care. In this case, root canal therapy. That's the, the clinical condition that I'm looking at studying. And that clinical condition doesn't come by itself. There's disease associated with that. We know 90% of the people from the first study had a diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis or pulpal necrosis for when they got their root canal. We also knew that 76% of them had a self-report of pain in the week before. So there's already stuff going on with this person. And what you're seeing in the bottom of the slide is time. So as we're a, it's a prospective observational study, and what I mean by that is, is we collect information before with the intervention, and we, then we follow them over time, and in this case, we followed them for six months. And what you're looking at the far right is the outcome that we're looking at. And this is a dichotomous. You either got one or the other, and we define that as either the person has no pain, and that's 90%, or the person does have pain, and that's represented at the bottom with the red, swollen, painful cheek, uh, and that's 10% in our sample. And what the squiggly lines that are in between are actually just representations of the different factors that I said up front. So we're human beings, we're not static, we're changing over time. And I think you need to consider that when you're doing your modeling about how things change over time. So the upper red line, that first blip, this is representation of surgical injury associated with treatment that was provided. So you're gonna have different biological factors that are probably be expressed at that time. And in the bottom, you're seeing social factors. Those are the ones that are thought to be fairly continuous. So the biological factors, most people understand them well, inflammation, pain, and that aspect of things. And examples of the psychosocial variables are depression, anxiety, catastrophizing. And this is why we call it a conceptual model, because we really don't know how all these different factors interrelate to each other. So we know they're kind of there, but we don't have a good understanding. We haven't done enough research to kind of say, well, yes, one comes before the other. So when we're thinking of pain, does pain cause fear or does fear cause pain? We know they interact, so we haven't teased that apart yet. This is where we need to go to our behavioral colleagues and clinical observations to tease some of them out to make that conceptual model a little, little tighter to represent what's going on. When you move into the social realm, you're looking at things like household income, education, marital status. An example of one here is gender. So I would argue that gender should be in here too. Most people would think, uh, gender, sex hormones, that's gonna be in the biological realm. But I would also say, hey, gender, we know there's gender roles in society. We know that patients choose treatment and engage in dental care differently as gender. And this is evidenced by some of our data that shows that 59% of patients actually are female. So in my clinical practice, I see patients two plus years after root canal therapy and they have chronic pain, they're overwhelmingly female. But our data is telling us that femaleness, that state, is not a risk factor. Well, what's going on? Maybe there's something that's happening in between during those squiggly lines that could be playing a role in helping us understand that. Is there something associated with genderness on care-seeking behavior that, that's happening there? So that's why we kind of need to look at that. So to kind of tie this conceptual diagram together is, is we get, get information preoperatively, we get information by treatment and intraoperatively. We pay attention to what's happening afterwards so that we can then predict what the outcome is. And hopefully we can do things to have that outcome to be a happy outcome in the future. So what we're planning to do is a study to look at predictors. We're calling it the predict study. Surprise, surprise, I'm not very uh, 
<laughs> make it really easy so I can remember what my study name is. And we're planning on starting at 2016. And when I wrote it kind of in a PICO format to kind of get me some an idea. So we're going to go like the cardiac studies. We need lots of people. So that's why I'm interacting with the network because they have lots of members that are doing de uh, dentistry. I have access to lots of patients. I want my data to represent what the average is out there. And they're going to be doing like they typically would, root canal therapy. And we're not asking them to change anything. We're just going to watch what happens with that. And then we're going to look at developing a model on the backside about who gets severe post-operative pain, which is 7 out of 10 or greater in the intensity scale, and that's 20% in the pilot study, and who gets persistent pain. Uh, and we're looking at one year for that. And the idea there is, is we can kind of model it to try and understand that so we can get a risk ca uh, calculator. We also can then look at some of our identifying factors of what's happening, how do things change along that pathway so that we can intervene, maybe before, during, or immediately after. And there's some also practical aspects of things. We can economize our care. If we know who's at risk, we can then design our studies to look going forward. On our table, Dr. Eli Eliev is going to talk about uh, some questions about, well, can we predict things from doing sensory testing? Well, now if you know who's at risk, you can pick the two groups and you can have an efficient study design to actually look at diagnostic tests and that aspect of things. So there's many utilities uh, of why you'd want to do this type of observational research. And with that, I want to thank a whole lot of people. As you can see, it takes a lot of people, and I want to thank Greg for heading this up, and NIDCR for funding it, and all the people doing the hard work on the ground, interacting with the clinicians and patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we're we're uh, for for a really good talk. We, we're now going to move to the table discussions, which we really think are uh, where uh, a lot of interesting discussion will take place. For those people who are sitting at the back who don't have a table, there's still some empty seats here. So if you could remember which of the topic areas, uh, please go ahead. And if our speakers can go ahead and actually take the seats on the table, we're probably going to give you about 35 minutes because we're running a little bit late. Uh, but have a relaxed and good discussion. There's some very, very good questions to ask. Okay, I wonder if we can just have the other panel leaders uh, to, to the table leaders to come to the table. Uh, Walter, I think we need you. And could we go for Larry? Uh, are we missing anybody, I think? Okay, so uh, w w we're going to go ahead so you can get an opportunity at least to... Oh, C Catherine, yeah, if you could come on up. Thank you. There's a seat right next to me here. So uh, we, we had groupings of tables, and they all asked uh, slightly different questions. Uh, so I, we're going to start out with a bi-directional table. It was a bi-directional research table on caries, on dental caries. And they asked two questions at the table in addition to the discussion. They, they asked from the practitioner and researcher's perspective what basic science areas related to dental caries can readily be translated into clinical practice and what are the challenges and barriers that prevent this happening. And the second question, and they might have got to it, or they might have just done the first one, is what mechanisms and frameworks could be used to strengthen the communication between researchers and clinicians to enhance translational science? So our first report out is going to be by uh, Dominic Zero, uh, who was the table leader for the uh, bidirectional caries table. Uh, is the mic uh, loud? I think it's loud. No, it should be okay, Dom. Um, Thank you, Cyril, and uh, I also want to thank my table for the excellent input in this. Can you uh, hear? Can you hear Dominic? I, I think he's. Is, is, is it on? Okay. Uh. All right. I first want to. Uh, I first of all want to thank my table for the excellent input into our discussion. Um, and I do have a challenge. I have to read Jim Bader's writing. He's left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, in tackling the, the first question, um, we tried to identify what um, areas would be uh, most appropriate for uh, translating across the basic science uh, clinical practice continuum. And um, we came up with, uh, as a group, um, 
the uh, uh, behavioral science, the behavioral sciences. So basically, if you look at the uh, dentistry and, what, and, and how we can generate oral health outcomes, you have two sides of it. You have the behaviors of the patient and how that impacts dental caries, but you also have the behaviors of the dentist, how they diagnose, how they treat, what, to treat, what threshold they treat us. So you really have two big behaviors that influence the outcomes uh, of patients, behaviors of dentists, behaviors of the, of the patients. Um, another interesting area would be biofilm research. Um, and we looked at this uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of ways. So uh, we can do biofilm re research to identify what would be innovative in interventions that can modify the pathogenicity of the biofilm and, and improve our health that way. Uh, but also the possibility of doing um, diagnostics site-specific on specific tooth surfaces uh, that can be used to collect the plaque and actually analyze biomarkers in that plaque that would be indications that that particular surface may be susceptible to the progression of the mineralization and eventually carries, and then by identifying uh, the risk for that surface to, to become carious early on, we can uh, intervene appropriately and prevent that from happening. And these are things that could be, uh, could be studied in a practice-based research environment. Uh, another area was imaging, uh, early caries detection, uh, using some of the, the scientific, and this is already one of the topics that's being addressed by the PBRN, so that's somewhat being assessed. Um, uh, risk assessment, uh, and as well as looking for general biomarkers that could be uh, salivary diagnostics that could be used to uh, identify at-risk patients. So that's where basic science w could come into play and be tested in a clinical set, a setting to see if we can have highly sensitive, highly specific biomarkers. Uh, we also talked about materials. Uh, what we probably need to get uh, to move the equation away from what we'll call more interventional dentistry, surgical intervention, to more um, non-invasive or less invasive or non-invasive dentistry. We need better materials that dentists can apply to an early lesion and arrest that maybe uh, one step beyond, say, uh, sealants and some of the current materials. And then uh, the opportunities that the omics present, genomics, uh, proteomics, uh, metabolomics. Uh, but these are, we felt as a group, that this may be a little bit more in the future. Uh, but hopefully uh, down the road, these are things that can be used to identify patients and, and uh, identify the risk status, as well as to uh, identify appropriate interventions, uh, personalized dentistry, or precision dentistry for that specific patient. Um, we did also talk a little about some of the challenges that, that basic scientists might face in moving their ideas to the, to the, to the clinical arena. And uh, the challenges are how to get um, companies to, willing to develop some of the technology. So the challenges, the cost involved in developing new technology and also the challenges of working with the FDA to get approval so it can actually be used, a device can be used in, in a, pra uh, a clinical environment. And, and can you repeat the second question, Cyril, so I can uh, frame it? The, the mechanism and frameworks, uh, what mechanisms and frameworks could be used to strengthen the communication between researchers and, uh, and clinicians to enhance translational science? Right, so, so basically we felt that uh, that probably the, the modern um, media, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, the social medias may be a very useful tool uh, to target uh, specific clinicians or uh, to get them involved with uh, some of the, uh, the opportunities that exist uh, and, and to really ch channel their thinking in a more, uh, um, in a different direction. I think we sort of have a cultural problem in, in, in dentistry is that uh, uh, maybe we'll say the older generation of clinicians really don't use a lot of technology. We, I think we had uh, one statement from the table that only about 10% of the PBR and dentists actually are regularly on the internet. So this may not be a, a useful approach for the current 
PBR and dentists, but perhaps engaging younger dentists who use these social medias may be an opportunity to, to engage and, and get them interested in this. So it's sort of, it's sort of gen and, and the other thing is we, we have, you know, how do you gen generate, to get to shift things, you have to change culture. So how do you change culture? How do you get the profession to move from um, sort of doing what they're doing to actually take greater responsibility uh, for having the, the best information, the best knowledge, the best evidence in managing their patients. I mean, uh, the patients expect that. So a question I like to ask is, uh, and I challenge my dental students, I challenge uh, CE courses, you know, dentists at CE courses, I'll say, how do you want to be treated? Do you want your physician or your dentist to be informed with the, 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 the latest evidence and it, so they can treat you in the best possible way? So I think we have to challenge the profession to think that way so that dentists are more comfortable getting engaged in this discussion about technologies or about new technologies, about new, the new scientific findings. So it's a cultural change that has to take place. So I think with that, I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an excellent report. It was a pretty uh, interesting discussion. Did pretty well with your left-handed writing too. So, <laughs> so, so thank you very much, Dominic. So we're going to move to the next table, which is the uh, bi-directional research. Same questions, but this time it was in the area of pain. And uh, Eli Eliav is going to actually give the report from that table. Uh, we need that back bottom mic. I think it's it okay be. now. Uh, we had a good introduction. Don Nixon's presentation was on, on the same topic, but chronic orofacial pain is, is, I think, very difficult to diagnose, and it's very difficult to decide when, when it is the, there is a dental source and when there is chronic condition that is beyond the dental source, that the dental pathology. And, and I think that the best thing, and, and that's a part of the discussion that we have, the best progress that we have, or the important progress that we had, was relying on anecdotal clinical observations. If you remember from dental school, the Costin syndrome, um, that was the first time to describe a muscle pain related to something, we went way beyond that. Or uh, the atypical odontalgia, which is the post pain part of, post, uh, part of it is post pain that uh, Don was talking about. It was described, I think, by Joe Marbach uh, way, 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 uh, I mean, in the, in the 70s, in the late 70s. And those were clinical observations that led to further research. And we gave some examples how clinical uh, uh, observations made some, help us make some progress in the lab and in the clinic in those uh, cases. Based on that, we thought that we, uh, we, have, to, we have to have a, a listserv uh, among the PBRN of people that are interested in pain and would like to share some clinical observation that they see with the chronic pain patients, because this is missing. And uh, we thought that that will be very, very helpful. Um, another thing that we thought that we are, in, we are ready for that, after we identify the patient that are at risk to develop that chronic pain, as, uh, from the first PBRN study, maybe we can take the patient that are at risk and have those patients follow them prospectively after dental procedures, either endo or others that I'll mention in a second, and have narrative reports or a, a quantitative or qualitative narrative reports from those patients, then we can learn more about what they're going through and what is leading them from the position they are in to begin with into that chronic pain stage. And can we change it? Can we interrupt in the middle? And what can we do? I mean, those, this information is missing because usually all the data we get is from a study, somebody in one uh, specialized clinic taking all the data, but not from the really the dental clinics where we usually to the chronic pain clinics, we get the patient after they've been through lots of procedures and, and, and painful procedure for the dentist and for the patient. Uh, another thing that we wanted to add is relying on validated tests that have been validated in other NIH-funded NIH studies like the OPERA and, and other studies, use simple quantitative sensory testing in our patient in the PBRN group. For example, it has been shown that uh, mechanical pain threshold is the most validated and predictive factor or for developing uh, myogenic or chronic TMDs. Uh, this is easy to do, and that can be easily added to those patients that we think that are at risk to develop those conditions. This can add another layer. Um, we, we always 
asked the question about is trauma or the duration of the treatment is, can induce that myogenic uh, pain. And uh, we can add that and using that quantitative assessment testing to try and link between the two. Other tests that can, can, can be done, things that uh, tested that have been shown to be associated with uh, post endopain, like the duration of cold sensation after applying cold sensation to the gums, and other tests that are proven, shown, and been uh, studied. So to summarize, we would like to have a, a, a group of people that will discuss the symptoms. We would like to do prospective follow-up to patients that we think that are at risk and add simple quantitative sensory testing to those group of patients that every dentist can do in their practice and that can help us diagnose and maybe better treat our patients. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I, I think we can take a, a few questions on the bi-directional tables if anybody has. Uh, any pressing question right now or comments? And if not, we can move on. <laughs> um, okay, obviously the discussion was vibrant at the table, so they, they answered most of the stuff. We're going to move on to the study designs. There were a series of study design tables. The study design tables asked the same question, but in different topic areas. So uh, we're going to have one report out in the interest of time and then add the other table leaders if they have anything additional to say. Uh, the questions that were asked at the study design table were, uh, how should study designs be modified for practice-based research and why? And the second question was, how do we overcome the limitation to and maximize the advantages inherent in the practice-based research setting? Two pretty simple but very complicated questions. So uh, we're going to have Dorota uh, Kapichka Kedzerovsky, who's going to report out on dentine hypersensitivity, and then we'll get the additional table leaders actually uh, begin to actually add to that. Yeah, we had a very You like nice my pronunciation, Paul. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, um, thank you, Cyril. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion. We had actually an uh, international table, so that was very nice. Thank you so much, guys, for uh, having it uh, so interactive and uh, making it so fun. Um, in terms of dentin hypersensitivity, so uh, we need to take into consideration the structure of the network and its neighbor and its uh, members as well. So, because we have uh, dental practitioners and patients who are coming to the offices, so we need to make sure that the study design would be in the way that it's not burdensome uh, to the practitioners or patients, but also uh, practitioners are comfortable doing it. So, for instance, we chose in a cohort study uh, as a as a as a simple design. So the practitioners are doing their usual uh, dental uh, treatment and they are not changing anything in the practice. If we have asked for a randomized clinical trial, maybe that'll be more uh, difficult uh, for this condition. So that was one. And then also, um, the other thing is that we need to take into consideration that we should use measures for outcomes which are validated and reliable. And uh, we uh, will have uh, visual analog scales and also labial magnitude scales for pain, uh, which are both validated and reliable. So we thought that's, that, you know, that's how it's going to be in the study, but uh, in, in discussion we thought that this is an important uh, factor to consider. Uh, the other thing is, if there's anything new which is introduced to the, to the study that should be validated uh, in, before it's used, uh, so we have valid and reliable data, so that would be one. And uh, many members of the discussion brought up an issue, how are you going to develop your clinical forms? So, you know, we don't want to burden our practitioners and make sure that uh, they are happy with... Uh, with the work they have to do, because they are busy enough in their practices. So uh, uh, many of you guys said that we have to come up with something which is simple, quick, and easy. So that's self-explanatory. And then make sure we have exclusion and inclusion criteria for practitioners and patients, that they are very uh, simple and um, uh, well described, that there's no gray area, that everything is spelled out nicely. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in terms of what else should we consider when we uh, design the study in the practice-based research network and why, so when we collect uh, data, we need to make sure that we take into consideration patient characteristics, who are in the practice, and also patient expectations, look at their social economic status, educational level, uh, gender, age, and you name it. In terms of their symptoms, because uh, dentin hypersensitivity is very subjective, um, 
uh, condition, if you will. And we need to make sure that we have specific ways of um, bringing patients to the study, so how the symptoms are recognized and how the dentist diagnose the, the condition. And uh, in terms of pain of patients, description, how it's going to be, is it continuous, is it episodic, what elicited, and so forth. Um, we also thought about that uh, if we design a study like this, we need to make uh, into consideration that there are related factors to the condition, like what about the habits the patient has and other um, medical history and medications they are on. Uh, so uh, many of you guys who discussed it with us said that this is important, that we need to have a full picture of a patient. Uh, what dentifrices are they using and all of that. So that's question one. And question two, how do we overcome the limitation and maximize the advantages? And here we were a little bit um, more, I think I would think that we were uh, limited here. So uh, how are we going to recruit patients to uh, and practitioners to that uh, particular study? So um, many of you have thought that incentives are important, and uh, incentive meaning maybe uh, giving little tokens to patients, uh, but also uh, communication with patients, how you describe it to the patient, and maybe technology would be a, a good way to uh, improve our communication with patients. Some, someone uh, mentioned iPads. We will have text messages. Um, uh, we will have emails. We will also have those scales of pain are going to be available online if patient chooses to use it. So I think there are different ways to, uh, to maximize uh, uh, patient involvement. The other thing which I think it's very important is to bring staff to the uh, picture. So either it's a dental hygienist or a dental uh, assistant or a front desk that are going to be a helper to a practitioner. So that's what I have and thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dorota. Very interesting uh, discussion. And what I want to do is just move to the other study design tables and ask the table leaders, also in the interest of time, if they have anything additive uh, that they want to have in uh, one minute or less. Uh, Walter, if you can go. Walter's table was on oral cancer exams. And so uh, we'll move down and actually let some of the other table leaders and study design. Yeah. Yeah, Tom and I had a great table. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, and I picked up... Uh, potentially three collaborators for the next phase of the study. The two issues, uh, I think, with the terms of methodology, you had one, uh, we're looking at professional practice behaviors, and dentists also tend to do tests. So how do we get honest answers about what they do? Um, and we're, in our study, we're using a, a scale, zero to 100%. And the feeling was that we could, in terms of behavior, professional behaviors, we can probably get more, uh, more honest, look at honest answers. I think that was uh, good for me to hear, but it's something to, because whenever uh, the PBRN's looking at behaviors, to, uh, to consider that kind of approach. The other thing was a real uh, a geeky piece is that for the OC the oral cancer exam study, we, because it potentially could affect national policy, we need very accurate nationally representative uh, um, responses uh, for, for all our questions. And the PBRN isn't quite representing the, the national, but it has a great distribution of different practice characteristics. And we were wondering whether the, uh, you, there was a way to look at post-weighting, to look at the PBRN sample, compare it to a national sample so that for a study like this, we could get uh, national, truly national representative uh, 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 numbers. Very geeky. Good, good question. Thanks, Walter. Uh, we're going to move to Sonia Makija, who's, who did the, uh, led the table on study design in, in dental caries. Well, we had a lot of the same answers that uh, Dorota did, but one thing I did want to mention, we also moved into communication um, as far as speaking with other practitioners that are participating in the same study, and I just want to let everybody know that uh, within the next few weeks, we're going to be having a discussion forum on our website, Password Protected, where we'll have study topics such as uh, studies in the field, study results, quick poll results, so that way you can interact with each other, keep the interest going, um, and that's another way to um, just communicate with each other and engage with each other. So 
uh, we talked about that quite a bit because I think that's very important to keep everybody um, excited and, and interacting with each other and they may have hints of how they um, did a certain study and, and study results. So, But we had a lot of the same uh, discussions that DeRota Great. did. Uh, thank you, Sonic. We, we're going to go to Brad. Uh, uh, Brad um, uh, Rindle uh, did a table on management of temporomandibular joint muscle and joint disorders. Uh, so real quickly, the way we approached the design issue was starting with the research questions. And in the TMJD area, Dr. Schiffman's study, we looked at the questions. Were they important questions? And then we looked at the design to say, does this design make sense? to answer the questions. And then we got into the feasibility piece of it. And our mix of researchers and, cl researchers and clinicians both felt this was important and that the design made sense. I guess I just summarize our discussion that way. Good, good interaction. Yeah. And, and Jeff did a table on tobacco cessation, Jeffrey Fellows. Thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, our... Um, uh, we started off because tobacco cessation is dealing with behavior change is a really difficult and challenging issue for clinicians. And so I think we, you know, one of the things that we that started our discussion was that uh, one of the clinicians, uh, you know, has uh, electronic dental records, but there's no component within the dental record that he has to routinely document uh, tobacco use and cessation services. So it's not even in there for him. Uh, another one of our practitioners uh, is, is uh, in a system uh, in Australia and uh, where they have the system set up and yet uh, most of the folks aren't doing the cessation services and so it's it, that kind of puts you into the context of what the challenging issues are of, of basically starting out of what's the question and what's the com comfort level the practitioners in doing tobacco cessation and how they should uh, approach the, the issue and so um, I think that then it, it, there was uh, the discussion itself was about making sure that we weren't, uh, in a study design, weren't uh, asking uh, clinicians to, to do less than standard of care, uh, to make sure that we were, that was the basis point uh, for it, and also to, uh, as it re resolves around tobacco cessation, is, is making sure we're getting the entire clinic staff, so like the hygienist uh, team uh, with the dentist is gonna be an important component. And so I think we, we did, uh, that was kind of the focus of, of, of it, um, there was, um, uh, some degree of comfort with uh, actually with the clinicians being able to say, uh, yes, I will, uh, I can randomly assign a patient uh, to do uh, intervention A or intervention B with, with the assumption that the intervention B, if that's the control group, is uh, there's some sense that just by participating in a study, patients are gonna quit more uh, because, oh, lo and behold, they're participating in a study. So that's kind of the issues, additional issues that we've dealt with. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, I think a pretty broad range of questions and broad range of topics, uh, but uh, uh, covering sort of the range of things that are being done in, in practice-based research. The next topic area was a study design topic area, but we thought it was important to have a table which really addressed the issue of how do you incorporate behavioral science and practice-based research, an important part of some of the things we've been speaking about uh, related to, to uh, study design. And so, Catherine, uh, Demco uh, led a table on this topic. Thank you. I heard multiple times, I heard multiple times behavior being mentioned um, from the, on the, in the other table. So I think that it's appropriate we're, we're now, and we had, we had all the answers at our table. If you would have started with us, we probably could have, have, have done all those things. One of the most important things that we talked about was reflecting the same uh, pattern of meth the same methodology that's used in the practice-based research to bring in the, the providers, the clinicians input into these study designs. We talked about making sure that when you're that when you're um, designing, developing behavior change for that's targeting patients, that we also have that opportunity to get their input. And the practice-based research network would be an ideal setting um, with its access to patients to facilitate that formative research and engage patients and get their input in how to develop and design studies in the network that would benefit them in behavior change. Um, there was also a very um, clear voice about teamwork um, in behavior change and behavioral studies in the network. Uh, the dental hygienists are an incredibly important, have an incredibly important role in behavior discussions and particularly in prevention. And so um, always remembering um, 
in, in our network studies to include um, the opportunity for the Dell hygienist to be uh, not just a part, but in, in several studies that we talked about really being a lead um, in the design and the implementation of those studies. Um, um, time, time and money, um, also a common theme, I'm sure, across the groups, uh, came up here because oftentimes we talk about behavioral studies and behavioral change studies, and we want everything to happen within uh, two to three minutes is constantly what we were talking about at the table. And that may simply not be possible. And so, you know, what is the role of the, of the network in being able to implement um, really rigorous studies uh, still within the dental setting that can actually begin to influence and inform policy. You know, maybe right now we're not being paid for much of this counseling at all, but is it gonna be helpful to pay for three minutes if three minutes is not really gonna be effective? And so, uh, and so how do we design studies that may actually begin to inform how much time we actually need to uh, develop a study and implement a study that can actually have true effective um, behavior change? And I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a really rich discussion over there. Uh, we're going to move on, uh, and I think there will be, we'll, we'll leave time for questions right at the end, which are pretty broad-ranging, but uh, we had two tables on practitioner research uh, communication. Speaking really about some of the communication uh, issues, there were uh, quite a number of questions, a lot of questions that were asked about the obstacles, the assumptions, the approaches, uh, and, and how can these things be implemented in an educational way. Uh, and uh, Judith Albina is going to report out for one of the two tables uh, on practitioner research and communication. Thank you, <clears throat> Cyril. We had, a, we had a great table, and it was, um, I think, particularly appropriate for this topic of, of researcher practitioner communications because we had people from both worlds, people very much immersed in both worlds, and also some people who sort of bridged those worlds. And so it worked uh, very nicely. And we, we very quickly came to agreement and had a lot of fun uh, discussing examples of the kinds of communications problems that exist. And, and we summarized those by saying that they sort of fit into uh, three broad categories, and those, those categories I would describe to you as uh, differences between practitioners and researchers um, in terms of the cultures that they come from, the languages that they speak, and the goal orientations of those two groups. And um, to, to just give you a quick little example of the language issues, for example, that cr can create such problems with communication, we had uh, someone out of the practitioner side, primarily the practitioner side, described to us that when he was asked if he could do RCTs in his practice, he said, oh yeah, we do root canals all the time, uh, not realizing there's another world in which we're, RCTs are talking about randomized trials. So uh, we talked about all the ways in which we can, we can misunderstand one another. I was puzzled by someone throwing out the term one-to-one -one ratio, uh, ratio of what to what. And so there, there were just lots of examples that we had fun with in that regard. The differences of culture and of goal orientation have to do with, with where we tend to focus. Do we tend to focus on solving a problem, coming up with a solution, or do we tend to focus on procedures and methods and doing things in a way that means when we have an answer, we know that answer is supportable. And those are very different um, orientations, and they reflect, again, those different cultures. One culture perhaps being one that's absolutely about questioning, questioning everything, and, and uh, not just questioning the bottom line, but questioning how you get to the bottom line. And another one that says you don't question, you use what you're told is the best way, the best practice, and you go with that. Then we tried to move to, okay, what do we do about these issues and, and what are the kinds of approaches that we can use? And to summarize that very quickly, I think there are two things that we came up with. And one was involve as many people as possible. And it is above all, perhaps, about the staff when you want 
good communications regarding research that's taking place in, um, in practices. And the second one is make it visual. We talked about the need for FAQs, for gathering information about what kinds of problems of communication there have been. But then we said, and maybe those F FAQs should be in the form of YouTube videos, but some way of getting it out there quickly and easily, people can see what happens and using a just-in-time approach. So perhaps when there's a study that's being carried out in a number of practices, you find a communication problem, you do a quick video, and you get that distributed to the rest of the practices that are involved. I'll wrap it up with that. Okay, very, very interesting discussion. Was, I saw a lot of activity at that table. Thank you, Judith. E Elaine Davis led the other table. Elaine, do you have anything to add to that report? Well, we talked about much the same things, and we had a great table, too. We had practitioners, we had researchers, we, we had people bridging uh, both areas. And I, I guess um, to, to speak to the language and uh, uh, the, the culture differences, uh, one member of our table uh, did say that... Um, the researchers need to relax a little. That we can't, <laughs> we can't standardize everything, and the, the, our approaches are so different. We're just trying to come from the the, the two sides and come uh, meet in the middle. I think um, one of the the things that we talked about in terms of approaches is face to face meetings. And um, one of our table members is a regional coordinator, and she said having those regional meetings was key for some people, uh, that they remembered that that was uh, life-changing in that they saw a different approach to practice than what they were doing, and, and now they're changing their approach because of it. And it, I think, also gets people uh, involved. And I want to just reiterate what several uh, people have said. You, you can get the dentist on board, but if you don't have the staff on board, who is the one who's really collecting the data and, and going to be the, the people... Um, Involved, you, you need to involve the staff. So involve people early in communication and often and, and make sure it's everyone. Yeah, great report. Thank you very much. Uh, we had two tables on a global uh, international collaboration. We actually, you know, we started off with one table and because of the additional number, we put two tables together. But the reality was that there were people who chose that as one of the topic areas, but there were many internationals or people from outside the United States, uh, from a lot of different countries that are interspersed among the other tables. So we had those discussions at a lot of different levels. But Valeria put together an excellent table. Uh, would you go ahead and report out, yes, Valeria Gordon? absolutely. So I want to also thank Dr. Marta Summerman for uh, having this initiative to have the Global International uh, Collaboration Table. And I think we, uh, we had a good discussion. We had true representation from all of the continents. Uh, we had from Japan, from Chile, uh, Brazil, uh, Canada, Australia, South Africa, UK, and the Netherlands. So we had a, a pretty good participation there. And we, we shared uh, that uh, the ultimate goal is to improve patients' health. And uh, the way to do that is to speed up the translation of research findings. And we learned that we have to find out uh, who are the stakeholders in our own countries, you know, and maybe uh, to initiate the practice-based research process there, uh, really being close contact with the clinicians and find out what are the uh, key components of the clinicians in each uh, country and uh, what are important for them before you, you, you start to assembling. So um, we also shared ways for us to recruit and to keep the clinicians engaged. Um, for example, uh, in Australia, we had uh, the network there had like 60 participants and uh, she was, uh, Denise uh, was leading that effort and she thought it was uh, very, uh, got good support from the Australia Dental Association, so perhaps seeking support uh, in some countries might not be necessarily from the government, it might be from dental associations, it might be from even industry. Uh, uh, we also uh, learned that uh, uh, NIAC in the Netherlands, he's doing a lot of uh, research. Uh, he has about 61 uh, clinicians and practices, and he started with retrospective studies, but he's moving forward now, selecting a group for prospective studies. Uh, Lee Can in South Africa, it started with 15 uh, clinicians. So we, we were sharing uh, our experiences and trying to learn from each other the lessons. Um, uh, in the end, we um, 
trying to find out also what is the hook that we can use to sell that uh, to, uh, so that in order to obtain funding. And it may be in socialized countries, it, it might be uh, the country, the, the government that perhaps might be interested in, uh, especially in improving patients' health and, and dropping costs on the delivery of health care. Uh, let's see what else. We also shared that um, uh, perhaps uh, having some uh, collaboration, uh, learning about the software that we use for the analysis and, and the websites, how we are going to, to recruit the clinicians. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. And we pretty much agree that we need to, a key component is for us to identify the clinicians who can be the flag holder in order to help us with that, uh, maintaining the communication with other clinicians and keeping the clinicians engaged in the research process. That's great, thank you very much. And, and, and Greg uh, Gilbert did the other international collaboration too. Right. Thank, thank you. So we also, we also were fortunate that our table had a broad range of international representation as well as a broad range of experiences in PBRN research from uh, those whose research has not moved outside the academic health center to those who have done PBRN projects for several decades now in their countries. So that provided an interesting mix. Uh, and the latter group demonstrates that yes, there can be legal and regulatory ba uh, barriers to international PBRN research, but they, those barriers can be overcome. So uh, those PBRNs have demonstrated that it can indeed work. Um, the other uh, interesting comment was that uh, the collaborations that have already occurred uh, between U.S. and non-U.S. and between countries within Europe uh, have capitalized on the differences in healthcare systems, practitioner behaviors, and patient populations. And that is not an impediment, but it can actually be uh, the object of the research, looking at the difference, how these differences can actually impact care, cost, and treatment outcomes. So that provides a rich environment and justification for doing international collaborations. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Greg. Go ahead collaboration with uh, Naoki in Japan. And Naoki uh, came to the United States and learned about the practice-based research and took the idea back to his country. And he was able to recruit, uh, to date, 282 clinicians who are involved in the research process. And he started with very little funding, $10,000, and, and he, he grew. And we, the way that we collaborated, he, he uh, used uh, a lot of the materials that were already available through the network, and we have been collaborating that way. So to date, about uh, 14 manuscripts and abstracts have been published in the last three years with, uh, as a result of this collaboration. So that is a successful story, and we hope that with the collaborations and the interactions that we have had today, that we can move forward to other countries as well. Yeah, very good. Uh, you know, we're, we're running over time, so with your permission, if I don't see any big objectives, we'll take just a few questions because I feel we haven't given people an opportunity to interact uh, to the panel from the audiences. Are there any comments, questions that people would like to have? We have some roving mics and there's a mic right in the middle uh, for anybody on the panel. You don't feel like you have to, but I, I just want to make sure you have an opportunity in case you want to. People are all talked out. <laughs> Okay, I, I, well, you know, let me just then close that and, and we close pretty much on time. Just to thank uh, the table leaders, each one of the table leaders. Oh, sorry, the one. Uh, oh, great, Martha, that's terrific. That's, no, no, I'm pleased you actually have. It was, you know, one, one of the things as I was listening, one, um, it's great and there are a lot of ideas and I see a lot of our staff here and so they're busily taking notes and so we will listen to some of the comments or all of them. <laughs> but um, one of the things in terms of the uh, bi-directional and one of the limitations that uh, was mentioned, and I'm not too sure if some of the dentists in, in the community, I'm finding that some of our researchers and even our associate deans at dental schools do not know that we fund small business uh, programs. How many of you know about those? 
So, so I really, yeah, so some people are shaking. So I really think we need to do, so there's an opportunity. It's SBIR, STTR. One is, has to be um, at an academic, um, it, at, at, at a business, and the other is can be, um, the PI can be the academic. It has to be a small business. Um, but there are opportunities. Phase one uh, goes up, and I don't think Dwayne is here up to about, I think it's capped at a higher level than it was before. It's like around 200 or something. I'm looking at you guys. Say that again? 150. I thought it went higher uh, with special. And then the other is up to a million, I think, for phase. <laughs> phase two is up to a million. So I just... Um, and we had our first symposium on the SBIR, STTR here uh, with very few people coming in. And I really think it's an interesting area because I always feel dentists have new technologies and inventions and things that you'd like to put forward. And there are opportunities that way. Please um, email me and I'll send it to the right people if you have any thoughts or ideas or are interested or you have um, people that you've talked with that are interested in this area. So thank you for that opportunity. Oh, thank you very much, Martha. So, so uh, I, I, I want to also thank the people. The, the table leader spent a lot of time preparing the questions and, and refining them, and then also they spent a lot of time at the table. I want to thank the, the speakers at the symposium because they spent a lot of time, and thank you, Martha, for joining us. Uh, we're really pleased to have you. There's a lot of uh, staff in the audience that spent a lot of time trying to put this together. I want to thank them as well. Uh, you know, it's difficult to summarize this thing in a closing statement other than to say that it's a very rich discussion that was had. We will try and distill a lot of the information that came from the tables so that we have some document that at least picks some of the ideas that came through uh, in a way that actually we can share with people. There, there is a video being taken of this as well as audio recording, uh, and that'll be available both to people here but also people outside. So then I want to thank you all for being here. It was a great discussion. Uh, very, very enjoyable. People seem to be, I saw a lot of hot air coming up from a lot of the tables. Uh, so it was very, very nice. Thank you very much.